I want to show you some neat things you can do with the debugger object available now in nightly builds of Firefox. First I need to set a preference so that Firefox allows us to use the debugger object. So I'll go to about config and I'll set devtools.chrome.enabled to true. And I should point out that when you set this, any code you paste into Scratchpad or other developer tools is going to run as Chrome. So if you don't understand the security consequences of that, make sure you turn it off when you're done. Here I have this silly little web page I made that computes factorials and Fibonacci numbers. Uh, you probably remember from school that 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, which is 6, and 7 factorial then is 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which comes out to 5040. Uh, the eighth Fibonacci number is 13. And here's the source code of these functions. Uh, you can see that I've written both of these as recursive functions, that is, they call themselves the factorial function fac calls fac, and the Fibonacci function fib calls fib, twice actually. And today I'm going to show you a neat visualization of how these functions work. We're going to go from zero to something actually kind of interesting in just 10 minutes. So let's get started. We'll select Tools, Web Developer, Scratchpad, and select a browser environment. And I'll start by getting hold of the window that I want to debug. Now I can create a debugger object to observe this window. Today I'm interested in function calls, so I'm going to use the onEnterFrame event. The debugger calls this hook every time uh, we enter uh, a function or a script tag. And I'll just do an alert. Frame.callee.name is just the name of the function that we've entered. And that's a working example, just five lines of code. We can run this, and when the web page goes to compute 3 factorial, we immediately get an alert. Now this is interesting, um, it says entering on click, and if you look at the web page source, you can see that when we push this button, uh, what happens is that this on click handler runs, and this alert is showing us that this on click handler is just about to start. So when we click OK, what the on click handler then does is it calls fac, since we're computing 3 factorial, fac is called 3 times recursively, and then we're done. This is the alert from the web page, not the debugger. See the alert telling us that 3 factorial is 6. Well, this is nice, um, but you know, I also want to see an alert every time I leave a function, and it would be really nice if I could get the return values. So here's how we do that. We just say uh, when we uh, enter a new frame, we'll say, by the way, debugger, on popping this frame, I want you to call me back again and give me the result of executing that function. So we'll write another alert here. Okay, I want to do one more thing before I run this again. Uh, when we enter a function, it would be nice to show what the arguments are. So we'll do that. Frame.arguments is just the array of arguments. We'll put commas between them. Okay. So we'll run the new code. Here we are entering the onclick handler again, showing the uh, event that's the uh, argument. Uh, entering fact 3, fact 2, fact 1. 1 factorial is 1, 2 factorial is 2, and 3 factorial is 6. And you might have noticed we entered 4 frames, but we only left 3. The onclick handler hasn't returned yet, and that's in fact correct. Um, we, when we click OK here, then the onclick handler will, handler will be done, and we do get an alert from the debugger saying that it returned undefined. Okay, so this is nice, but it's kind of a pain to have to click all those alerts. So let's try to visualize this data some other way. I'm going to start by getting hold of the document and creating a div. We're just going to put a div into the web page itself, the web page that we're observing, 
And uh, whenever we run code in that web page, we'll dump the debugger output to this uh, div. We'll just put it way down at the bottom. Okay, And instead of an alert here, uh, we'll add some HTML to that div. We'll create a span. And here's how you add text to a span. Uh, we'll actually have to add the span to the document so we can see it. And likewise in the on pop callback, instead of an alert, uh, we'll just add more text to that span we created. Uh, and instead of that word returned, I'd like to use a nice Unicode arrow. I'm going to cheat and steal one from a web page. Okay, there we go. Much nicer. One last thing. I have a style sheet that makes these spans a little easier to see. And I'm just going to inject that right into the web page by creating a style element. I'll just paste this code in. I had this code prepared in another window. Um, uh, because you don't want to sit me, watch me sit here and type CSS code. This is just one really, really long line of CSS. And so we can, uh, we can run this. And now we get a span for the onclick handler and a span for each call to the factorial function. And that's good, but it's still not quite what I want because all these spans are separate, see? I really want the spans to nest the same way function calls nest as the program executes. I really want to be able to see that this function called this function called this function called this function and the order in which they returned. And this turns out to be surprisingly easy. All I have to do is make sure the output goes to the right place. So uh, when we enter a frame, I'll say, from now on, I want you to direct all new output to this new span that I've created that represents this new uh, function call. And then when we leave that frame, I'll say, okay, from now on, don't send any more output to this span, send it to the enclosing span, the parent node. So let's uh, reload the web page to get rid of all these spans we've got so far. Run all this from scratch. And now you can see the final hack. You see the onclick handler called factorial of 3, which called factorial of 2, which called factorial of 1. You can see what they all returned and in what order. We can see 7 factorial, which makes an even bigger pyramid. We have to scroll over just to see it. And if you compute the 8th Fibonacci number, then we can see that the straightforward recursive Fibonacci function is ridiculously inefficient. There's a lot of redundancy there. It doesn't even fit on the screen, but that's okay because we have the technology actually to show you your pyramids in 3D. So if you want to learn more about the debugger object, you can go here. Um, if you want the source code for this example, you can go there. And if you just want to know more about Fibonacci numbers, uh, you should watch this video right here. Thanks for watching. Have fun with the debugger object, and uh, keep in touch.